Okay, hello and welcome back to another week of Ask Bike Tree, where we talk about the latest uh, Bitcoin on-chain activity in the wider crypto asset market. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, remember that this is a session for you to okay, ask questions. Okay, hello and ask. welcome back to another week of Ask Bike Tree, where we talk about the latest... Sorry about that. Um, and so we can kick this off. Well, when you're ready, you can put, pop your questions into the comment box and I'll be reading them as you can hear on the side and, and uh, asking them to Charlie or answering them myself. So let's kick off the discussion, Charlie, by talking about uh, this week's, uh, well, many big stories, but let's start with Bitcoin's 20th doubling. Yes, that was quite fun, wasn't it? I mean, it sort of um, crept up on us having um, seen the last double at 32k back in, um, or just uh, just over 30k back in January, 31k, wasn't it? And um, and so we started off um, um, the new year with that, and then you know three and a half months later we're, we're on the 20th double, and you know I made the point in the piece um, this week that two to the power of 20 is is more than a million. It's a million and fifty thousand or something, and so you know anyone lucky enough to put one dollar into Bitcoin in 2010 at six cents. Um, now has a million dollars. So James, how many people did that? How many people A, bought them and B, didn't sell them? I mean, That's it's really want to know. It's really, it's really quite remarkable. Um, and, and then you add to that that Satoshi Nakamoto is now uh, one of the richest men or entities, individuals in the world um, with, a, with a net worth in, in the billions. I think you made a good point is even the people that were able to buy Bitcoin or mine Bitcoin at a dollar um, and hold it until now. Um, sorry, how, how could they possibly have held it till now? I mean, it's uh, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do with the with the cycles that Bitcoin goes through. No, it is. And, and, um, and, the, and the, one of the problems with, you know, hanging around this space for too long is, you know, you, you spend your whole life waiting for the next 80% correction. And it's only the people that have recently turned up that don't think that's going to happen. And they're far more bullish than the, than the old guard. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Charlie, you've been around in the industry for a while. What was the price of Bitcoin the first time you ever looked at it? 100. Oh, no, 100 the first time I got properly interested. But I, had, I did look at it in 11 or 12, 2011 or 12. I can't remember which one it was. And, and dismissed it. I said, don't be ridiculous. Um, you know, a friend of mine had pointed out to this space. I said, "Don't be ridiculous! You can't possibly have money on the internet." And um, so that was a big mistake. That probably cost me a million dollars. Mistake. And then there are the ones that have thrown their Bitcoin away. But let's move on to our first question uh, here on the chat. Um, so it's a question about Metcalf's law uh, and and the network effect. Um, so what do you think about Rao Pal's view regarding ETH? Uh, that it will follow a near, apparently Rao's view is that it will follow a near identical path to Bitcoin uh, because of the sort of network effect that's around it and therefore, you know, could reach as much as $20,000 in this cycle. Well, amazing. But, you know, I did look at the fees, the gas fees and think there's a bottleneck to all this stuff. I think people have got really simple two factor models going on, which are kind of ridiculous, which make so many assumptions. Yeah, the people are taking demand for granted as if it's easy to come by. And, um, you yeah, know, I don't take that view. And I think that, you know, I love Bitcoin and Ethereum and all that stuff. It's all very exciting space. And I go back to the basics of, you know, the concept of exchanging data and um, on the internet, sorry, exchanging value on the internet is, is very, very powerful. But, you know, the gas fees are so high. At what point does that choke off the growth? And certainly what we're seeing on Bytree data is, you know, the bigger numbers, bigger prices, bigger fees, um, less real transactions, fewer transactions. So the good old stuff that got us here over the last 10 years, um, people doing whatever they do on the blockchain, um, they're being priced off. They've been priced off the blockchain. So it is becoming monetary. And so it's all about the money and, um, you know, pray for lots of money. Charlie, I think that's a really great point you make is the idea of Metcalf's law is that each additional uh, user on the network is able to generate, you know, more uh, value so that the value grows exponentially to the number of users or in, with a similar sort of coefficient. Um, but that uh, relies on the fact that there is utility for those new users. And what you're saying is, you know, if fees become so high, then you can add all of these new users. But actually, you know, the utility is almost declining with the usage because you're not able to get your transactions uh, through um, on the platform. 
So if you think about, you know, how that would relate to say social media stocks that very much follow that, that sort of um, growth model, it would be like saying actually now, um, you know, there's congestion in the messaging world and you can no longer actually, you know, communicate to certain people or in a certain way over Facebook. Um, and so it would have this declining sort of limiting, um, limiting sort of growth. So yeah, it's a big problem for Ethereum and it's one that, that they're trying hard to solve. Um, and Bitcoin doesn't have this problem because the transaction activity is already down. And so therefore there's plenty of capacity on the, the Bitcoin network. The transactions are currently going through freely and easily. Uh, that it's expensive because it's all big money and no one wants to, no one wants to sit in the ether and wait uh, no pun intended. So people are all paying the big fees to make sure that the big money is protected and, and settled quickly. So, um, you know, it, it, it's becoming more and more expensive. But I think, you know, if, if you take the monetary, the monetary view, then so what? It, it's OK. You know, it, it can work like this, but it's just a very different beast um, to, to what we're used to in the past. It's all happened rather quickly. It's all the last few months. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so last point on that, before I go into it though, I'm going to say uh, this is not financial advice. We're not financial advisors. Uh, nothing we say should be construed as an investment um, investment advice. Um, but, you know, ETH, $20,000, let's just quickly look at or we'll talk about, you know, ETH versus Bitcoin, what we saw last cycle and where it is today. I mean, relative to Bitcoin, ETH looks hugely undervalued. Yeah, but um, there's on a sample of one, right? So the, the the problem with a lot of a lot of econometrics in the whole space, I mean, like the like the, the wonderful stock to flow models on a sample of two, you know. So you had two two halvings when it, when when the model was written um, to observe and then extrapolate. So it's pretty weak. And then you know, with Ethereum, when Ethereum come about, was it 2015? I think or 2016, the first yeah. price. And and so we've, we've got you know we've got one cycle to look at. And um, so it's pretty unconvincing comparisons here. You know, it's not like looking at, uh, you know, two ancient assets and, and comparing them mm. property against gold or something. Mm. Very true, very true. The, the future is very much being written. So, okay, let's move on to our next question here um, about uh, the sort of long-term prospects for Bitcoin and the future of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, let's break it into two. What are the long-term prospects for Bitcoin? Um, and how likely is it that one day it becomes at least an informal global reserve currency? I think it's entirely possible. I mean, you know, the, the, it's, the, it's the, the sort of conversations I've been having recently with clever people who have recently discovered Bitcoin. When I say discovered, I mean invested in or embraced or started to analyze. They've known about it for years. They've dismissed it in the past because they said, well, that's a fun little toy, but now it's real. Now the whole monetary thing's really going. So there's a bunch of big macro people who are pretty clever, who, 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 who are now more bullish at higher prices than they were at lower prices because they say now it's real. And, and so I, you know, I, I, I buy into that. And, um, and I think that's, that's pretty exciting. I do think an informal asset is a, you know, an informal role in the financial system is important. It's a private asset. I just don't see the central banks um, making this a part of their portfolio at all. I mean, it's only really the emerging market ones who are particularly active in gold anyway. And so, you know, forget Bitcoin. They're not coming anytime soon. Maybe some of the wacky ones um, get involved at the margin, but it just, it just doesn't seem that likely. I think what's really interesting about the recent breakout at 60K is it did so, as I wrote my piece, on relatively low volatility. Not, not really low, not sort of 20, 30%, but, you know, mid 50%, which is, you know, following a big rally like we've had in the last uh, year, um, which is basically... Um, you know, 5,000 to, to 60,000, which is, you know, quite a lot, isn't it? 12 bagger. Um, and to, to have that sort of volatility following that move just gives me more confidence that actually for the first time in the last few months, that we're not going to see uh, an imminent 80% correction, which was very much my fear in early January. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that the fact that the vols can't, that the market's calmed down and there's some sort of... Um, 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 consolidation, you know, I think that, that that's definitely positive. Um, the mystery really is, you know, where all the money's coming from, because, you know, some of it's coming through the funds that we track, but but not all of it. And finding the source of all the money, you know, we think it's, you know, to the, 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 uh, the, the growth in stable coins is clearly in there. And the Coinbase data yesterday was interesting that they published on, you know, all the, all the retail money that's come in so much, uh, way more than institutional. 
So you mm. can kind of see that, um, uh, that it is growing, there's lots and lots of interest. But you know, we, one of the things we're really striving to do at Bike Tree is get the full picture to try and fully understand. And we think we understand most of what's going on, but to understand all of what's going on is really our mission. Absolutely. In terms of a sort of reserve currency, um, the steps that might need to happen in order for uh, states or governments to actually take you know, an asset on as a, as a reserve currency, you kind of think they're not going to go and buy it from the open market. Um, you know, if there was a real um, sort of systemic case for putting um, the uh, Bitcoin on, on, on the, the balance sheet, um, they could make it illegal. You know, it happened with gold, with the, the Gold Reserve Act in, I think, 1934, 1935, um, where you know, the Federal Reserve essentially was uh, the, became the core holder of gold. And, and that, um, I imagine, dropped, you know, destroyed the gold market in the short term um, and then allowed you know, central banks to and, and governments to actually start to accumulate it. So, well, it destroyed the gold free market. The free market, right. It didn't destroy the gold, the value of the price of gold. It just fixed the price of gold. And obviously, over time, that became more and more ridiculous and too low to where it needed to be and then unlocked in the 70s. There yeah, you're right. And then yeah. I, think, I think you're allowed to own some gold, but it's not very much. Like, um, you know, a, a bit like when you go to the bank today and ask for £10,001, then, then they start all the forms come out. See, so everyone, everyone puts in 9999, you know. That's it's probably two, I think it might be two thousand now rather than ten thousand. But um, you know, goodbye cash. Where did that go? I think what I'm sort of playing at is the idea that if it will become you know in the future um, an informal global reserve currency, then the type of markers we might expect to see from governments would be heavy regulation, you know, and some sort of uh, more sort of control over the asset in order that they can you know have a position because ultimately. You know, the one thing central banks will not do uh, easily is yield their control over the monetary system. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult for a central bank to get involved now because it's, um, it's proper money and um, it's very expensive to, for them to, to, to have a decent position. And politically, it would be a very difficult thing for them to do. It would be quite odd when the regulator is saying one thing about Bitcoin and, you know, certain parts of the investment industry are highly sceptical and think it's a fad and uh, for the central bank just to pile in after a big rally, you know, I, don't, I, I just can't see that happening. Um, so therefore, that's, that's just not going to happen in, in a nutshell. But it's a private asset and the government can get involved by hanging around the fringes and um, they can tax it. I mean, one of the things about, uh, about um, uh, nationalisation of, of assets, for example, the railways or what have you, is it's sort of pointless because you don't, the government doesn't need to own the asset. They could just tax it and regulate it. So why would you bother? You can have all the influence you like and you can extract as much value as you like um, with those policy tools. So, you know, it, uh, there's no reason why a government couldn't just say, right, OK, in this country, in the United Kingdom, um, all, all to and froing with Bitcoin going through the financial system. We're going to give you a um, not just the capital gains tax, but an extra tax if they wanted to. Or they can they can do that. And they can also set the rules for all the legal actors in the country. Of course, that leaves the illegal actors. But, you know, it's not it's pretty difficult to be an illegal actor these days. I mean, you have to go back to the Silk Road. That looked like it was too good to be true with the anonymous money, as they thought at the time, and uh, the dark web. And look how that turned out. So it's um, it's quite hard to, 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 to do things under the radar. I think you've got to, um, if you want to be successful, you have to, to, to very much fit in with the system. Absolutely. Um, OK, let's move on to our next question. Thank you for that. Uh, so... Um, it's about crypto asset data and crypto asset data providers, you know, what the concerns can be on, you know, the type of data being provided. Um, so, I mean, I can answer that. I mean, the, because of this, you know, blockchain accounting, if you like, Bitcoin accounting is, is still relatively new and it's developing all the time. Um, it isn't exactly clear who, which, you know, parties are sending what balance to other parties and um, so without getting into the weeds too much a bitcoin relies on an unspent transaction output uh, model uh, which aggregates all the change from previous um, exchanges or sort of transactions um, and then we'll sort of put together those different um, utxos bits of change merge them and then send them uh, to the recipient and when they do that 
you know, it's very unlikely that you'll have the exact amount um, of, of change that you that the person wants to receive. Um, which means then, you know, there are two transactions at least that happen. One is the value that goes to the recipient and the other is the change that then goes back to the original wallet. So that's just one example um, of, of how you know, sending transactions works on Bitcoin. And it's not always simple to know, you know, which is the actual economic value transfer and which is the change coming back. Um, and then you throw into the mix, you know, coin join transactions. Uh, where you have a huge amount uh, of different entities participating in a single transaction and splitting out to multiple other participants uh, in order to obfuscate you know, the traffic. Um, you've got complex, sorry, batched, we call them, um, com uh, sorry, no, the coin join we call complex transactions on the terminal. And then we've got the batch transactions, um, which is used by exchanges in order to reduce you know, the amount of sort of volume that goes into blocks to, to reduce the fees. So there's a lot of different nuances in how you you know read this on-chain data, um, and so you know all the different data providers have a slightly different methodology for extracting uh, this information, and so you know that's probably the the comment you're referring to um, about this variability in in data that can be provided. The way that we try to approach it is to look at our competitors' data, um, and I'm not going to name names, but there are some you know that we have a huge amount of respect for, um, and you know we do cross-reference our data against different uh, providers and make sure that we're closely aligned with the ones that we think have a very strong methodology. You know, going forward in the future, at some point, uh, we expect there to be a standard approach to how you read um, this data, uh, but you know, as I said, it, it's still continually evolving. Um, so there's lots of work to be done there. Um, next question, we have a really relevant topic, which is Coinbase's uh, IP, well, direct listing um, yesterday. Um, and you know, Charlie, does Coinbase's uh, listing act as a stamp approval for the wider crypto asset space? Well, there's, there are more and more proper stocks, aren't there, um, coming through to the market? And, you know, it's interesting that the call I had yesterday with a with a broker, an old school broker, um, was saying that you know I looked at the space. He was looked very much interested in the equities, not interested in the coins, but the equities around the coins because that's his business. And um, said, you know, I looked at it a couple of years ago, and the only businesses making any money were, were miners. I'm sorry, were exchanges. He said were exchanges, um, and and of course miners as well. But he didn't mention those. And he said now there are more and more things going on. There are more and more. Um, ways to attack this space and, to, and, and you know, Coinbase obviously got in early in a very simple business model of just sort of taking a carry on people's ownership and and really I think that most of their growth has come from the price of Bitcoin as all of these companies have as opposed to uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the the accounts opening and the fees are it's, just, you know, it's been astronomical I mean, since they started the, the price of Bitcoin is one or two hundred X and so Fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I think I read somewhere that they have about fifty-six million uh, users. So, you know, it, it's not it's not negligible. Um, yes, the no, 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 no. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But you know, the power of something, the power of the underlying going up by that much. It helps certainly. Oh, it helps. By God, certainly it helps. In terms of what it means for sort of the wider uh, financial uh, services sector, you know, Coinbase at one point yesterday became the fourteenth largest financial services company in the world uh, with only 1200 employees so you know that's around the level uh, or the size uh, that Goldman Sachs is valued at um, and it took Goldman Sachs 152 years and 40,000 employees to get to that same spot um, so you know if you're at all sort of unsure about whether you know this uh, industry is for real whether it's here and to, to lay down a mark and, and stay there in the future, then I think, you know, that's your answer. I, I just say that as an equity investor now, it's quite interesting because there, are, there there's actually some credible things to buy. So you've got coin shares in, 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 in Sweden, that's an asset manager. You've now got Coinbase. Um, they need to get more original on the names, don't they, going forward. There's too much coin going around. Um, and then you've got some, you know, Galaxy and Argo and... Um, and hive mining, the list is getting longer. And so you're getting to the point when actually um, it's, we're not far away to, from having, you need a, a fund needs 22 stocks to, to pass the diversification rules. So you're looking for 22 credible stocks. I think we're probably about halfway there. 
Sorry, can you just extrapolate on on that a bit? When you say a fund, like um... oh, because because um, if you if you wanted to launch a fund, um, then it's only it's only in Europe under the ESIS reg, 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 regulations. There's a um, a, a 5, 10, 40 rule, uh, which is your diversification requirements. And so you couldn't put you know you couldn't put two stocks into a um, into a fund or, or five stocks or whatever. And, and so Terry Smith is, is basically the pioneer here. His fund is 22 stocks. So you just pass the, that's the fewest you can possibly get away with to pass the diversification rules. Brilliant. So something like the Elwood uh, blockchain ETF then? Well, the Elwood, the Elwood ETF, of course, is diluted. It's not pure blockchain, isn't it? There's lots of stuff there that's, that's really pretty, pretty tenuous in its link. Um, that, that's my point, really. The, right. the, you know, double, double the number of stocks we've got already, and then, and then we're, we're pretty much onto a, a proper basket of, of reflecting this space. And, you know, it could be that these, these just become um, long-term mainstream holdings in the future. But hilariously, my, my, my dear old employer, HSBC, banned MicroStrategy um, this week from from their trading platform. So retail clients can't buy MicroStrategy. No regulator told them to do that. I mean, they just thought, ooh, Bitcoin, that's bad. So we'll ban that. And they've, um, no doubt they'll, they'll ban Coinbase. I mean, it's just slightly ridiculous. I mean, it, it, I'm almost lost for words at how, you know, how different those two sides are with Coinbase you know, up there is one of the 14th largest financial services company and then HSBC not even allowing their customers or their clients to buy MicroStrategy. It just seems, you know- It's a stock on a recognized exchange. It's incredible. It's incredible. And I'm sure they're not doing themselves any favors with the newer generations um, who are paying attention well, to- Well, can I tell you which of the last stock, because I worked there for a long time, I tell you what's the last stock they banned trading on. Huntington Life Sciences in the 1990s, the late 1990s. And that was basically a company that had to be protected by the government in the end, because they basically were doing testing on animals. I think they had all these beagles who were doing, you know, 50 a day, more relies, and um, that wow. sort of thing. And, you know, shampoo in the eye, you know, nasty stuff. And, uh, and the animal rights guys came after that. So they, they blocked trading on that. In the end, no one would bank it. And so the Bank of England had to step in and bank Huntington Life Sciences. <laughs> That is absolutely yeah. so, to put, so that's the only other stock in history I think they've banned. And so you've now got hunting life sciences and um, anything to do with Bitcoin. Okay. That is an odd one. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Earlier you made the comment that you know we're not likely to see um, these 80% plus drawdowns or less likely, uh, let's say, in Bitcoin. Um, so the question is, you know, if that's the case, how does the market health sort of strategy or the network dem demand model perform? Uh, versus a buy and hold uh, Bitcoin? Well, that's a really good question. Obviously, if the drawdowns are lower, then the case for market timing is, is, is less prevalent. But we don't know that it's the end of the 80%. I mean, that's the Michael Saylor view, you know, the, the head of sales, mega bull, Michael Saylor. We don't know. I mean, between now and the next halving, it could easily be the case that... Um, um, that we do have some nasty correction. I mean, you know, if, if market, I mean, markets are going to have lots of corrections. So why would Bitcoin be exempt from the sort of bad action that's inevitable in this crazy world we live in, which we have to stimulate our way out of each time? Mm -hmm. They put the brakes on the stimulus and the system will crash again. I mean, it's, they tried it in 18, it didn't work and they'll, they'll try it again this time. We're already, talk, we're already talking about, um, uh, about calming the stimulus. You know, I think that this whole space in, in, in blockchain, it's, it's, it's gone up 20 times. It's already been the best investment in history. So, you know, people, people should, should um, you know, calm their expectations. And, and as I pointed out in this week's piece, that 20 doubles, you know, in the first epoch, there were eight, in the second, there were six, and the third, there were four, and this epoch, we've had two. So, you know, you're not going to get eight doubles in an epoch anymore. And I, and, and I really hope that uh, no one's going to extrapolate that and say there's no more doubles. I don't think that's, that's the point at all. But, you know, um, um, I'll, I'll, since, since there aren't many people, I'll give a little scoop. And, and on Monday, I think we're a million Bitcoins to go till halving, aren't we? It's either Monday or Tuesday. And, um, uh, uh, and that's, you know, very, very simple. $62,000, 1 million Bitcoins, six point, uh, $62 billion needs to come into the network. Uh, three years, because it's going to be about May the 5th, so it's three years, one month. Um, very, very simple mathematics here. 
You know, 20 billion a year, please. 20 billion dollars a year, please. 20, and that's inflows, isn't it, Charlie? That's inflows. And, you know, gold's only done that once in 10 years. So, you know, you really do need to keep this cycle, the hype cycle going. Um, so are we going to have 80% corrections? I mean, maybe they're 60, but, but uh, we, we, corrections are not behind us. Absolutely. No, um, but, you know, I think, I think that, that 95, 90, I can't see that. 80, I'd be disappointed if I saw that again. I mean, last March was only 50, wasn't it? Or was it a bit more, about 60 or something? Mm. you know probably more like that 50 60 probably more i think it's i think it's what did the stock market do so if the s p goes down a lot you know um if, if, it, if it only goes down as much as the s p then then that's pretty good but i think bitcoin probably does worse than the s p in a correction still mm -hmm. okay so volatility is dampening in bitcoin it's still very uh much present across the rest of the altcoin uh, market um, now you have a company like coinbase that's listed with their coin uh, that is you know an ac access into let's say uh, more of the kind of picks and shovels behind the gold rush is it likely to be less volatile than the crypto crypto assets themselves um, do you think coinbase or, or do you think that we'll see it move quite uh, quite correlated to let's say bitcoin or even the total crypto uh, market well, in the short term, it's going to be way more volatile. Um, so let's, let's, let's say, okay, you know, come, come Christmas, you know, to the back end of this year, I think it will just be a proxy for Bitcoin. But it should probably be always be a bit more um, volatile because it's geared, isn't it? Because you're taking the price of Bitcoin and you've got operational gearing. So if Bitcoin doubles, then the Coinbase profits will more than double. There's mining economics, basically. House building economics, mining economics, all very simple. Airline economics, once you've paid your fixed costs and the price goes up, then, then you just get more and more benefit. So, um, yeah, I think it will be more volatile, but that will probably tail off um, um, towards the end of the year. Once we get used to it, you, know, you, you want to see a company report a few times. And then when it's done that, then they're, they, you know, people get more comfortable with it, more relaxed about it and all the rest of it. Yeah, they yeah. might pay a dividend. If they paid a dividend, by God, that would make it less volatile than Bitcoin. Okay, brilliant. So on to the next question. Um, many Bitcoin maximalists uh, think that Bitcoin will only reach its full potential once all the other altcoins have gone to zero. So Bitcoin is the only, the only uh, asset in the game. How do you see Bitcoin dominance trending long term? Well, it's, 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 it was, well, in 2009, it was only Bitcoin. And there was a brief moment when we got excited about altcoins in 2013 and 17. But basically, it's always been about Bitcoin. Still, it's basically about Bitcoin. Ethereum gets a look in. Liquidity adjusted. This space is 95% Bitcoin. You know, there's a lot of path in, in some of these, these things. But if you actually try to trade in size, then you'd soon find out what the real price is. So it is, it is a Bitcoin story, massively so. I mean, you know, contra to my view in 2013 was was very much the um, the AOL view. Um, you know, AOL was was all great, but it was superseded, and so that's why you know I came at this at the beginning thinking, wow, it's about tracking which coin it is, and I, and it's only in the last couple of years I've just realised that it's just not about that. It's about trying to understand Bitcoin, and you've got to allow for innovation to 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 happen around Bitcoin. There's nothing wrong with that. Not, you don't you shouldn't wish it away. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the space. You've got to keep experimenting. It's the experiments that create value. You know, you have 1,000 experiments and, you know, one good one and you've changed the world. So I've just pulled up a little chart here um, of Bitcoin's dominance. And we can see that, you know, in the bull run up until 2017, that was the highest point. So early 17 in February, um, we were at 85% Bitcoin. Uh, by the end of uh, 2017, so beginning of 2018, we were right down at 40%. So sort of early stage of the last bull market into the late stage, you know, we, dominance fell significantly. Um, at the end of this year, sorry, last year, we were up at about 68%, 69%. And now dominance has dropped into the low 50s. So, you know, it does, the, the way that the, the market seems to move through these cycles is that Bitcoin draws in the, in the investors and the interest, and then it sort of trickles down and flows out into the wider ecosystem. So 
So, you know, what's interesting in this cycle now is this discussion around yield farming and DeFi products. So, you know, money that flows into crypto can then go from Bitcoin, you know, actually into uh, other instruments. So, you know, it could become wrapped uh, into wrapped Bitcoin, uh, which is a huge market, about 1% of all the Bitcoin um, now. Um, and, and then it can go into a, a yield farming protocol like Compound, um, where, you know, you're able to generate an, an interest rate for that, uh, that Bitcoin that's been locked. And you're subsequently growing the value of that protocol because that protocol um, is issuing, you know, governance tokens that people want to have and, and so on and so forth. So whilst Bitcoin inflows um, have been around, I think we've got about 55 billion in funds at the moment, uh, Charlie. And, and at the same time, we've got around 55 billion uh, in locked in uh, yield farming protocols. So, you know, yes, the Bitcoin has been Bitcoin has been leading the charge, but I'm not so sure that it's going to be um, a one coin uh, world in the future, because I think these sort of neo banks or neo neo banks, um, so to speak, would are starting to become useful. You know, they have a utility uh, rather than just being a token with a with a promise of, of something in the future. So yeah, I think I think quite the reverse. I think um, in order for Bitcoin to thrive in the long long run, um, will mean that there is you know a wider sort of blockchain uh, economy um, with all the different banking services and identity services uh, and so on. Um, so, but some of those could be more utility and don't need to be quite so valuable. Yeah. True. Um, if this whole monetary thing for Bitcoin plays out um, as, uh, as as is the current narrative might not yeah. might not all very exciting there's just so much to keep an eye on out in the market and um you know every, every week there, there's a new uh, new topic to discuss but this week uh, that's all we've got time for uh, thanks for joining us and we'll be back the same time next week um, have a good rest of day